Thank you very much, uh, Manish. My very good friend and colleague, uh, Dharmendra Pradhanji. Mr. Uh, Reki, Arvind Mahajan, Manish, Nitin, Mich Mikhail from uh, the World Practice of KPMG. I see a lot of good friends here, R.P. and Singh, who insisted that I must fly in from Bombay for this very important uh, Enrich 2015. I see Rahul Gupta from the solar energy side, Raju, who must have heard Mr. Pradhan with rapt attention given his requirements of gas for his gas stove plants. Though I think some of them are now coming on stream with the new policy that uh, came in some months ago. Mr. Haldia, who heads the PTC Financial Services. Mr. Santosh Nair uh, from IIFC. A lot of friends over here. I, I may not be able to acknowledge everybody. But uh, it's always interesting to get up 5 o'clock in the morning, take the flight and then spend an hour and a quarter in the car. Of course, we don't fret and fume. We just uh, take it in the stride over the years. But at the end of the day, the redeeming factor is that you see KPMG or other organizations taking so much interest in your sector. You see people concerned about what's happening in India. Good, bad and ugly, it's, it's important to address all the issues, I think, uh, holistically. And uh, in, in some sense, I must uh, say, Mr. Pradhan, very rightfully drew the broad horizons of the energy sector. We both have responsibilities to the people of India. We both have to ensure energy as a sector keeps the wheels moving. He does it more literally given the impact of oil and gas in the vehicular sector. And we have, I have to make sure that the wheels of progress in terms of industry, in terms of the people getting energy, electricity in their homes round the clock. So we complement each other in our activities. And in that sense, it also reflects the very nature of the working of this government, which has patterned itself on a very organic entity. When it comes to any issue before us, before any of us in the government, the style of working is one of complete uh, oneness, a style where we are all engaging with each other to find the right solution, to find the right balance, to find solutions to very vexed problems. In fact, as soon as I walked in, the first conversation Mr. Pradhan and I were having was on something to do between NTPC and Gail, which I read on the flight coming into Delhi. And in some sense, the deep knowledge that Mr. Pradhan has of the coal sector, of the power sector, given his own involvement over the years, coming from a coal-bearing state, a very important state, which provides large amounts of coal, large amounts of electricity to all of India. Of course, as he rightly pointed out, it's another matter that the people of Orissa themselves are deprived of electricity for years and years even deprived of industrial progress for years and years. But that's the sad commentary on the kind of governance we've had over so many years. And, and it's not a question about politics, it's not about trying to politicize an issue, but truly very saddening that 68 years after independence, if Prime Minister has to declare from the ramparts of the Red Fort that... Uh, the most urgent task before this nation is to reach electricity to those 18,452 villages which till date haven't seen electricity in their homes. I mean, it's really very, very unfortunate that in a state like Orissa, barely 2% of the electricity is consumed for agriculture, something which on a national average would be about 20%. It's extremely unfortunate that, as Manish said, barely a year ago, the newspapers had to have screaming headlines about 
power plants shutting down for lack of coal, coal being in deep distress, short supply, concerns about whether the country would face a complete shutdown or a major chaotic situation in the power sector. All of this actually is a matter of agony, but at the same time, as uh, Prime Minister Modi articulates very often, he does not look at these things as challenges or crisis. He tries to convert each one of these into an opportunity, an opportunity to leapfrog into the new technology age, an opportunity to try and set things right at the base so that we can have fundamental and structural improvements which last a lifetime for this nation. And over the years, if you will see, what India has been used to have been band-aid solutions. We've always tried to address a crisis for what can be done in the short run. It's not as if the coal crisis is new. It has been there for several years. But the solution for the crisis in the past was not how we can increase coal production, what are the enablers, what needs to be done honestly and efficiently. <clears throat> but the solution was found in importing greater quantities of coal. And we've reached a stage where last year we've imported nearly 215 million tons of coal. Maybe about 45 million of that is coking coal, where India still has some challenges. We've not been able to mine enough coking coal in the country as yet. But I still don't understand why a nation like India, which has probably the third largest coal reserves in the world, and 300 billion tons of determined reserves, still has to import 160, 170 million tons of thermal coal in the country. And mind you, my bigger concern, and I often uh, say it in private conversations, is that we will be spending large amounts of national scarce foreign exchange to import coal in these years. And we've done that at very high prices, often over $100, $130 a ton in the last decade or so. And on the other hand, the world is moving towards alternatives. And I don't know, 20 years, 30 years down the road, maybe 50 years down the road, Will there be such growing demand for coal at all? Or will we be left with large amounts of coal reserves lying underutilized or unutilized, having spent billions of dollars on importing coal in the times when we should have been using coal, domestic coal, providing low-cost energy for the people of India? We've managed to survive on imported coal. And by the time we set our house in order, events would have under overtaken us and we would probably be moving into a new era altogether. So it's a dichotomy which really if we had addressed 30 or 40 years ago, India today would not be, have been in a situation where we find energy prices quite high, a situation where people are deprived of a basic amenity like energy. And it's not only those 18,452 villages. There are still about 50 million households, which could translate to 200 million, 220 million people, still deprived of energy seven decades after independence. And I think that is, that is a matter of agony for each one of us. And I'm sure each one of, of, of you in this room will share the concern with me that how can we ever look at social harmony? How can we ever look at a nation that develops for all, where everybody enjoys the fruit of development? How can we ever look at a nation where all the children of, of, of tomorrow get equal opportunity to compete in the world? Now, how can a child who comes, who's born into your home or my home, compete with that child from the, uh, the desert areas of Rajasthan or the the forests of Orissa or the hills of Uttarakhand who don't even have electricity today, who don't have access to computers, to internet, to Mr. Google, to libraries, to quality education. How can that child ever compete 
when it comes to competitive exams for engineering, for medicine, for international admissions, scholarships. And this disparity will have to be addressed at the root. And when we go to the root, the critical elements of that would be quality housing, affordable energy access, good schools with teachers who are committed to their job, hospitals where the aged can get timely and decent uh, health care, both preventive, curative, palliative, all of that. And this kind of a holistic vision, sadly, has not been presented before the people of India for years and years now. In fact, when we talk of energy security, and I, I do hope during the course of the day today, a lot of good ideas will come on the table, and I hope Arvind or Manish or somebody will share those ideas with Mr. Pradhan and me. We are hungry to know more. We are hungry to learn from all of you experts in the field. What more can we do? How can we do our job better? How can we reach energy to those 200 million people faster? How can we keep energy costs affordable? And in all of that, it will have to be a collective effort. Energy security cannot be the effort of Mr. Pradhan, me, or even Prime Minister Modi. It cannot be the effort of a central government or even all the governments of India put together. That's what, when Prime Minister says, will be the effort of Team India to create energy security. And I say that because energy security has many dimensions where each one of us in this room gets involved. If we use LED bulbs and we propagate the use of LED bulbs, you're looking at reducing consumption of electricity by 100 billion units a year, a nation of India's size. 100 billion units a year. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the current consumption pattern. As the economy grows, as homes are made for people, as industrialization comes in larger measure, this will increase further. Similarly, in the automobiles, can we look more and more at getting into efficient automobiles? Can we look at three, four, five-star rated air conditioners and fans in our homes? Can all of us who are involved in industry re-engineer our processes to see how we can become more energy efficient? And after many years in industry and now in government, I personally am convinced that any amount of effort and any amount of investment that goes into energy efficiency and energy conservation pays back real quick. And in that sense, things like renewable energy or clean energy, energy efficiency, possibly clean coal as we go forward to process our coal and fossil fuels better to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions out of that. All of this will have to be an effort where all of us are in it together. And it can be done. It's, it's, none of this is difficult to achieve or impossible to have. When Prime Minister articulated his vision of 175 gigs of renewable energy, there were enough and more naysayers and the skeptics and the cynics. Articles were written by very eminent people ridiculing the very idea. And very eminent people who even today keep uh, writing in uh, very important publications and deriding the leadership of the day in sometimes in very, very unglamorous and very unsavory terms, today are acknowledging the reality that, yes, India's ambitious target of 175 gigs is not only doable, but it's essential. It's necessary for all of us to focus our energies on that. And it's not only about climate change. When we talk of solar energy, let's say 100 gigs, it's not only about climate change. It's not only about reducing the impact of greenhouse gases or fossil fuels polluting the environment. It's a lot to do with India's energy security. Because long after the world runs out of fuel or oil or gas or coal, we will continue to be getting the benefit of a benevolent sun 
shining on the nation. We'll continue to have rivers flowing. We'll continue to have the wind blowing itself across the nation. In fact, Edison had written probably 80 years or 90 years ago that I hope the world does not run out of fuels before they realize the importance of nature, the importance of the sun, wind, water for meeting the energy needs of, of the world, of the planet. And in that sense, while uh, we are working together with, uh, with Mr. Arvind Panagri, our Deputy Chairperson of Niti Aayog, to try and create a blueprint for India's energy security going forward, a blueprint which addresses not the short-term, the medium-term, but a reasonably longer-term vision, how India will go forward. The effort of this government is not only to bring down imports, not only to make India self-sufficient, not only to ensure affordability of energy, along with access to each and every individual in the country, not only to become a power surplus nation, where you can come to India and set up your industry on tap. In fact, uh, there were some newspaper headlines which were screaming loud that India's PLF has fallen very, very much. And India is working at very low PLFs. I was confused. I thought that's a matter of joy, not a matter of sadness. Because there is no investment, no industry is going to come and invest in a country which is perpetually energy starved. I don't think if any, when KPMG deals with any international investors, I'm, not, I'm, I'm quite certain that investors won't come to India if they're going to tell them that energy is going to be scarce, you're going to need to run DG sets, generators for your energy needs, you're always going to be uh, sh in, in shortage of power, it'll take you one year or two years to get your electricity connection. I'm certain no investor is going to be very excited about coming to a country like that. But if you see the recent ease of business rankings, one of the principal elements that brought our ranking uh, up by 12 uh, notches was the ability to get electricity connections quickly and the ability to have adequate power when you set up your industry. In fact, I have now talked to all the power ministers in the country that as a first step, can we guarantee to anybody in the country an electricity connection, wherever the grid is, within 15 days of his making an application. And then we would like to bring it down to seven. I, of course, started with one, but I don't always have my way in the working of government, so I didn't succeed on that one. But we've settled that, okay, let's push for 15 to begin with. And then we'll shoot for seven. But that's the type of country people want to come and invest in. That Yes, they have a PLF which is hovering around maybe 60% now. So I have the ability to... 65%. So I have the ability to add 40% more power in all my plants along with the additional power we'll get from the renewable energy push, from the UMPP push, from replacement of old plants. And we can ramp it up quicker. The, the running of the 24, 25,000 megawatt of gas-based plants, which were mostly stranded uh, when Prime Minister took uh, charge of government in May 2014. And many of whom we have now re-established, restarted at between 35 and now, I think, 50% PLF. Right, Raju? So we've been able to provide them gas through an innovative pooling mechanism with the support of uh, the Petroleum Minister, Mr. Pradhan, and his team, working together as, as, a, as, an, as a team within the government. We've been able to draw up a scheme where nearly half those plants are now over 50% capacity. And maybe another half would be at about 35% capacity. And all of this through, a, through the highest level of transparency, never seen before in the country, be it the auction of coal blocks, be it the procurement of LED bulbs or solar power. I, I do hope you are aware that so, the last bidding on solar power and uh, the, the report that has come out today has acknowledged some of the fall in solar power rates 
in MP to 5 rupees 5 paisa, in Telangana to 5 rupees 17 paisa per unit, in Punjab to 5 rupees 9 paisa per unit, and now their most recent NTPC bids at 4 rupees 63 paisa per unit. And mind you, it's not something that, that's just happened out of the blue. It's, it's a combination of factors. It's a combination of working in partnership with the industry, bringing in the highest level of integrity, honesty, and transparency in the entire procurement process, bringing in fair and equal opportunity to everybody to participate and secure India's energy future. It's economies of scale with the confidence that uh, stakeholders have now that India's renewable energy plans are there to stay. They are going to be ramped up. We are investing heavily in transmission ability, green energy corridors, setting up solar parks. The confidence that comes with the leadership, the confidence that comes with meeting your commitments to the stakeholders, the confidence that people have that we are willing to put our money where our mouth is. So when we found discoms were a source of stress and possibly padding the, on the prices, we had NTPC come into the fray and possibly Seki is the next opening their bids today, tomorrow or today is the last year, yesterday was the last. Now all of these AAA companies becoming the procure, procurers of power literally eliminate your counterparty risk. Help you to borrow, I'm sure Mr. Santosh Nair will be happy to borrow and to lend in single digits with a counterparty risk like, and I'm, I'm just trying to hint. I'm not persuading you, I'm not prodding you on that. But possibly we can look at single digit lending on renewable power, particularly given that counterparty risks are being addressed very aggressively. And now with the, and, and I don't know, did you plagiarize your title from my Uday scheme? Because no. I didn't know about this report till this morning. Okay. But I didn't have an advanced copy of this. Okay, but anyway, the rising sun, and that's what Uday is all about. Not about the sun only, but the rising of India. And the rising of India's power sector. And uh, Mikhail, for you, Uday is the, is the revival program for all the uh, DISCOMs who are under stress. It's Ujwal DISCOM Assurance Yojana. That's efficient discoms an assurance to give india efficient discoms the program that assures that india's discoms will be run well and the word uday the acronym means rising so in some sense uh, i think kpmg and we are working together for the rising of the power sector and uh, i must acknowledge kpmg has helped us come up with some very important uh, programs the coal rationalization was first articulated through KPMG's efforts. The first, uh, I, I still remember, I'd just become a minister and uh, the feedback I got was that there was very little traction. You recollect that, Manish? For, for rationalizing these coal linkages, there's a lot of resistance. And I think I must have sat through hours and hours of meetings with KPMG and got the entire team on board to understand the value of that. And I think that 6,000 crore, a billion dollar saving that KPMG had uh, worked on is now becoming a reality. Large parts of it is getting implemented. We've taken that to the next level under Uday, where we are looking at a complete ability to exchange coal or to swap coal or to complete synergy in the entire coal and power production sectors so that coal is used most efficiently by the most efficient power plants at the nearest location and power is transmitted rather than coal and in some sense I, I can acknowledge that uh, all of you who are from KPMG can take pride for being a part of the evolution of the coal industry and the plans that we have to make it run as a well-oiled company, well-oiled machinery, producing more and more coal and eliminating imports. I've, I've been on record to say that I judge that by 2017, India should not need to import coal 
except for those coastal plants where it may be difficult to transmit coal for all of us. But I'm fairly confident that the, the era of shortages is over. And if I may draw your attention to the good old days when a very illustrious predecessor of my friend Mr. Pradhan, Mr. Ram Nayak, had taken India away from the era of shortages of LPG cylinders to an era of surplus, where instead of you bribing somebody to get an LPG cylinder in your home, or you reaching out to a member of parliament to get a coupon to get an LPG connection in your home, he had very rapidly converted it into a stage where three companies used to come and plead with you that you take the LNG, LPG cylinder from me. The distributors had to market their product to the days where Mr. Pradhan today is now creating a national web where we'll, his, his aim is that he gives gas to everybody in their homes, takes them out of the stone age of cooking through uh, wood and all, all sorts of very, very unhygienic mediums of cooking into LPG in every home in the country. You couple that with the ambition to give a home 24 by 7 power, a gas connection, a toilet in a person's home, road leading up to his home, quality education, quality health care. That's the kind of holistic vision that Prime Minister Modi is set out to do. His heart is in reaching the benefits of all these, uh, all the governments working to the last man at the bottom of the pyramid. And I'm very convinced, on a personal note, I, I'm not one to be making predictions and certainly not an astrologer, but I for one am convinced, given the kind of structural changes that the Indian economy has witnessed in the last 18 months, given the massive thrust on bringing in the highest level of probity and honesty in the system. Given the economies of scale that India stands to benefit from, with the large scale rollout of programs and uh, plans to reach benefits to the people, I'm very confident and I'm very convinced that you will rapidly see the economy picking up, you will rapidly see the fruits of this growth going to the last man at the bottom of the pyramid. My own sense is, and I was in Mumbai the last few days, taking feedback from all sections of society, from traders, from investment bankers, from fund managers. In fact, the last round happened only yesterday evening, where I had some people from several uh, analysts from several fund management companies who are giving me a feedback of what's happening on the ground. The broad perspective I, I have taken back or brought back to Delhi is demand is picking up, except the jewelry stores. Most other people, this Diwali felt there was an upswing in the demand. The auto sector is showing uptake in their sales. Most other People whom I met said that for the first time after several years, we've seen a Diwali where growth in numbers, consumer durables and all, look to be good. We'll wait for the final numbers to come out. But I'm fairly confident that in the next three months, six months, eight months, we'll see an upswing in the economy, which will be unparalleled, and take this country into a new level of growth, a new level of development. And certainly Mr. Pradhan and I will be working relentlessly along with this economic growth to ensure that the wheels of progress, the wheels of growth, the benefits of this growth are given, are given speed, are ensured adequate energy security, and we'll work together to make sure that the benefits of this growth, the benefits of energy, reach the people of India across the nation, reach the people of India in those far-flung forests and mountains and villages and small hamlets who have remained deprived for so many years. 
And I can assure you that the disruptions on the horizon that uh, this report talks about will be, will be brought into India to serve the poor, to take the benefits of energy security to the poor. I do hope we can look for the support of KPMG and all of you illustrious ladies and gentlemen in this room in our endeavors. And I do hope we can look forward to some very interesting deliberations during the course of the day, which will help us also further the task, uh, uh, further the work that we are doing in a better fashion, further our own efforts and reach these benefits to the poor of India. I wish this uh, day's conference all success and I'm sure all of you, well-meaning nationalist individuals, colleagues from the energy sector, will together help us draw out that roadmap which takes India into the new horizon with the rising sun. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I think uh, both the ministers, uh, what was very heartening, I don't know whether you picked it up, but both of them refer to each other. It is two ministries working on the energy security of the country, working in tandem and showing respect for each other. I think that's where the hope, faith and you know, progress of this country will move. I would just like to assure uh, the minister, the rising sun, we did not copy from him. Uh, uh, 2011 was the first report we released, sir, 2011. At that time, we predicted in the 2011 report that by 2016-17, India would achieve, uh, the solar would be on grid parity. We were almost right. We got it earlier, actually. And uh, people laughed at us at that time. They said KPMG has lost it. Uh, and or they are trying to say something which we can't understand. But I think the way change is taking place and the way technology is getting into change, you know, sometimes it makes me wonder whether this solar can do for power what mobiles did for telecom. I think that's something that, because it will be able to reach the unconnected, the 18,000 villages, unconnected villages. And if you look at the German model, which actually has got this, uh, where they have gotten for solar and where 50% of the energy requirements are actually coming out of alternate energy. I think India has got some great hope, but there's a difference between the Western countries and India. In the Western countries, you've already achieved your full capacity. In India, we've got to double our capacity uh, in the next 15 years. So there's a big play for both the, 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 the normal power, the, great, the thermal power, and also there is a great uh, opportunity for alternate energy to actually play a role. Uh, we take the points from both the ministers uh, um, who said that the deliberations, whatever come out here, people should think holistically, what are the energy needs of this country? We have got five sessions today. We've got 25 senior people from industry, government, who will be debating this. And we can assure you, sir, that we will send back all the important points that come out of this uh, for further consideration at your ministries. With this, I would like to invite Mikhail Soting to come and give a small token uh, to the two ministers for... In fact, we're truly honored to have two of them here, and it's really uh, been a privilege for us and for the audience to actually hear both of you at one time. Come. Mikhail, come.
Thank you, sir. Okay, we will take a, a break uh, for around half an hour now and we'll reassemble here by around 11.55. But as you move out, we have uh, quite a few copies of the KPMG Thought Leadership uh, Rising Sun kept over there. Those who are interested can pick it uh, on your way out. Kindly come back here by around 11.55. The next session will start uh, by around 12. Thank you. <laughs>